The following title by John Owen has never been narrated before, even though it is called The Mortification of Sin. It is not from his Collected Works, Volume 6, but from his Collected Works, Volume 3, On Pneumatology and Sanctification. And so I want to read relevant portions of this, which could be helpful to our listeners. It is known that this duty that is, the duty of the mortification of sin, is frequently enjoined and prescribed to us. Colossians 3, verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Mortify your members which are upon the earth, that is, your carnal earthly affections, avoiding or by avoiding fornication and so on. And so a distinction is made between carnal affections and their fruits. Or the special sins mentioned are instances of these carnal affections. Mortify your carnal affections, namely fornication and the like, wherein there is a metonymy of the effect for the cause. And they are called our members. First, because, as the whole principle of sin and course of sinning, which proceeds from it, is called the body of sin, Romans 6.6, 6, or the body of the sins of the flesh, Colossians 2.11, with respect thereunto, these particular lusts are here called the members of that body. Mortify your members, for he that intends not the parts or members of our natural bodies, as though they were to be destroyed, as they seem to imagine who place mortification in outward afflictions and macerations of the body, he adds, that are on the earth, that is, earthly, carnal, and sensual. Number two, these affections and lusts, the old man, that is, our depraved nature, uses naturally and readily as a body does its members, and which adds efficacy to the illusion. By them it draws the very members of the body into a compliance with it, in the service of it, against which we are cautioned by our Apostle, Romans 6, verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies, that is, our natural bodies, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof, which exhortation he pursues, verse 19, as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness, which some neglecting do take the members of Christ, that is, of their own bodies, which are the members of Christ, and make them the members of an harlot. 1 Corinthians 6.15 And many other commands there are to the same purpose, which will afterward occur. And concerning this great duty, we may consider three things first. The name of it, in which it is expressed. Secondly, the nature of it, in what it consists. Number three, the means and way in which it is affected and wrought. First, for the name, it is two ways expressed, and both of them metaphorical. By the word which we render to mortify ourselves. The first is used in Colossians 3, 5, which is to mortify, that is, extinguish and destroy all that force and vigor of corrupted nature, which inclines to earthly carnal things opposite to that spiritual heavenly life and its actings which we have in and from Christ, as was before declared, to kill, to affect with, or destroy by death. But yet this word is used by our apostle not absolutely to destroy and to kill, so as that that which is so mortified or killed should no more have any being, but that it should be rendered useless as to what its strength and vigor would produce. So he expresses the effects of it in the passive word, Romans 4.19. He considered not his own body now dead, now mortified. The body of Abraham was not then absolutely dead, only the natural force and vigor of it was exceedingly abated. And so he seems to mollify this expression, Hebrews 11.12, which we will well render of one and, uh, and him as good as dead, intimating a respect to the thing treated of, so that to mortify signifies a continued act in taking away the power and force of anything until it come, to be dead, 
to some certain ends or purposes, as we shall see, it is in the mortification of sin. Romans 8, verse 13, If you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Another word to the same purpose. It signifies, as the other does, to put to death, but it is used in the present tense to denote that it is a work which must be always doing. If you do mortify, that is, if you are always and constantly employed in that work. And what the apostle here calls the deeds of the body, he there expresses the effect for the cause metonymically, for he intends, as he expresses the same thing in Galatians 5.24, the flesh with the affections and lusts, whence all the corrupt deeds in which the body is instrumental arise. Number two, the same duty with relation to the death of Christ as a moratorious, efficient, and exemplary cause is expressed by crucifying, Romans 6.6. 6. Our old man is crucified with him, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, chapter 5.24. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, chapter 6.14. By the Lord Jesus Christ, the world is crucified to me, and I unto the world. Now, as perhaps there may be something intimated herein of the manner of mortification of sin, which is gradually carried on to its final destruction, as a man dies on the cross, yet that which is principally intended is a relation of this work and duty to the death of Christ, whence we in our sins are said to be crucified with him because we and they are so by virtue of his death. And in this do we always bear about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10, representing the manner of it and expressing its efficacy. Number two. Thus is this duty expressed, whose nature in the next place we shall more particularly inquire into and declare in the ensuing observations. First, Mortification of sin is a duty always incumbent on us in the whole course of our obedience. This the command testifies, which represented as an always present duty. When it is no longer a duty to grow in grace, it is so not to mortify sin. No man under heaven can at any time say that he is exempted from this command, nor on any pretense, and he who ceases from this duty lets go all endeavors after holiness. And as for those who pretend to an absolute perfection, they are of all persons living the most impudent, nor do they ever in this manner open their mouths, but they give themselves a lie. For number two, the duty being always incumbent on us, argues undeniably the abiding in us of a principle of sin, whilst we are in the flesh, which, with its fruits, is that which is to be mortified. This the scripture calls the sin that dwells in us, the evil that is present with us, the law in our members, evil concupiscence, lust, the flesh, and the like. And therein too are the properties and actings of folly, deceit, tempting, seducing, rebelling, warring, captivating, ascribed. This is not a place to dispute the truth of this assertion, which cannot with any reputation of modesty be denied by any who own the scripture, or pretend to an acquaintance with themselves. But yet, through the craft of Satan, with the pride and darkness of the minds of men, it is so fallen out that the want of a true understanding of this is the occasion of most of those pernicious errors in which the church of God is at present pestered, and which practically keep men off from being seriously troubled for their sins or seeking out for relief by Jesus Christ. Thus one has not feared of late openly to profess that he knows of no deceit or evil in his own heart, though a wiser than he has informed us that he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, Proverbs 28, 26. Number three, indwelling sin, which is the object of this duty of mortification, falls under a threefold consideration. First, of its root and principle, secondly, of its disposition and operations, thirdly, of its effects. These in the scripture are frequently distinguished, though mostly under metaphorical expressions. So are they mentioned together distinctly, Romans 6, verse 6. 
Our old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. First, the root or principle of sin, which by nature possesses all the faculties of the soul, and as a depraved habit inclines to all that is evil, is the old man, so called, in opposition to the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Secondly, there is the inclination, actual disposition, and operations of this principle or habit, which is called the body of sin, with the members of it. For under these expressions, sin is proposed as prosimptu, and a readiness to act itself, and inclining to all that is evil. And this also is expressed by the flesh with the affections and lusts, Galatians 5.24, deceitful lusts, Ephesians 4.22, the old man is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, the wills of the flesh and of the mind, chapter 2, verse 3. Thirdly, there are the effects, fruits, and products of these things, which are actual sins, in which, as the apostle speaks, we serve sin as bringing forth the fruits of it, that henceforth, we should not serve sin. Romans 6, 6. And these fruits are of two sorts. First, internal, in the figments and imaginations of the heart, which is the first way in which the lusts of the old man do act themselves. And therefore of those that are under the power or dominion of sin, it is said that every figment or imagination of their hearts is evil continually. Genesis 6, 5. For they have no other principle in which they are acted but that of sin, and therefore all the figments of their hearts must be necessarily evil. And with respect hereunto our Savior affirms that all actual sins proceed out of the heart. Matthew 15.19 Because there is their root, and there are they first formed and framed. Secondly, external and actual sins, such as those enumerated by our Apostle, Colossians 3.5 Galatians 5:19 to 21 All these things together make up the complete object of this duty of mortification the old man the body of death with its members and the works of the flesh or the habit operations and effects of sin are all of them intended and to be respected herein number 4 this principle and its operations and effects are opposed and directly contrary to the principle operations and fruits of holiness is wrought in us by the Spirit of God, which we have before described. First, they are opposed in their principle, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, Galatians 5.17. These are those two adverse principles which maintain such a conflict in the souls of believers, while they are in this world, and which is so graphically described by our Apostle in Romans 7. So the old and new man are opposed and contrary. Secondly, in their actings, the lusting of the flesh and the lustings or desires of the spirit, walking after the flesh and walking after the spirit, living after the flesh and living in the spirit are opposed also. This is the opposition that is between the body of sin with its members and the life of grace. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit, Romans 8 verses 1, 4, and 5. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live, verses 12 and 13. By this walking after the flesh, I understand not, at least not principally, the committing of actual sins, but a compliance with the principle or habit of sin prevailing in depraved, unsanctified nature, allowing it a predominancy in the hearts and affections. It is when men are disposed to act according to the inclinations, lustings, motions, wills, and desires of it, or it is to bend that way habitually in our course and conversation, which the flesh inclines and leads to. This principle does not, indeed, equally bring forth actual sense in all, but has various degrees of its efficacy, as it is advantaged by temptations, controlled by light, or hampered by convictions. Hence all that are under the power of sin are not equally vicious and sinful, but after the flesh goes a bent of the soul and the generality of its actings. 
To walk after the Spirit consists in our being given up to His role and conduct, or walking according to the dispositions and inclinations of the Spirit. That which is born of the Spirit, namely a principle of grace implanted in us by the Holy Ghost, which has been at large insisted on before. Thirdly, the external fruits and effects of these two principles are contrary, also, as our Apostle expressly and at large declares in Galatians 5, 19-24. For whereas in the enumeration of the works of the flesh he reckons up actual sins, as adultery, fornication, and the like, in the account he gives of the fruits of the Spirit, he insists on habitual graces as love, joy, and peace. He expresses them both metaphorically. In the former he has respect to the vicious habits of those actual sins, and in the latter to the actual effects and duties of those habitual graces. Number five, there being this universal contrariety, opposition, contending in warfare between grace and sin, the spirit and the flesh, in their inward principles, powers, operations, and outward effects. The work and duty of mortification consists in a constant taking part with grace and its principal actings and fruits against the principal actings and fruits of sin. For the residents of these contrary principles being in and their actings being by the same faculties of the soul, as the one is increased, strengthened, and improved, the other must of necessity be weakened and decay. Therefore, the mortification of sin must consist in three things. First, the cherishing and improving of the principle of grace and holiness, which is implanted in us by the Holy Ghost, by all the ways and means which God has appointed thereunto, which we have spoken to before. This is that which alone can undermine and ruin the power of sin, without which all attempts to weaken it are vain and fruitless. Let men ne take never so much pains to mortify, crucify, or subdue their sins, unless they endeavor in the first place to weaken and impair its strength by the increase of grace, and growing in it, they will labor in the fire where their work will be consumed. Secondly, and frequent actings of the principle of grace in all duties internal and external. For where the inclinations, motions, and actings of the Spirit in all acts, duties, and fruits of holy obedience are vigorous and kept in constant exercise, the contrary motions and actings of the flesh are defeated. Thirdly, in a due application of the principle, power, and actings of grace, by way of opposition to the principle, power, and actings of sin, as the whole of grace is opposed to the whole of sin, so there is no particular lust in which sin can act its power, but there is a particular grace ready to make effectual opposition to it, in which it is mortified. And in this application of grace and its actings in opposition to all the actings of sin consists the mystery of this great duty of mortification. And where men, being ignorant of it, have yet fallen under a conviction of the power of sin, and been perplexed with it. They have found out foolish ways innumerable for its mortification, wickedly opposing external, natural, bodily force and exercise to an internal moral depraved principle, which is no way concerned in it. But of this we must treat more afterward under the third head, concerning the manner how this work is to be carried on or this duty performed. Number six, the duty of weakening sin by the growth and improvement of grace, and the opposition which is made to sin in all its actings by it, is called mortification, killing, or putting to death on a number of accounts. First and principally from that life which, because of its power, efficacy, and operation, is ascribed to in dwelling sin. The state of the soul by reason of it is the state of death. But whereas power and operations are the proper adjuncts or effects of life, for their sakes life is ascribed to sin, on whose account sinners are dead. Therefore this corrupt principle of sin in our depraved nature, having a constant powerful inclination and in working, actually towards all evil, it is said metaphorically to live or to have a life of its own. Therefore is the opposition that is made to it for its ruin and destruction called mortification or killing, being its deprivation of that strength and efficacy in which 
and wherein it is said to live. Secondly, it may be so called because of the violence of that contest which the soul is put to in this duty. All other duties that we are called to in the course of our obedience may be performed in a more easy, gentle, and plain manner. Though it is our work and duty to conflict with all sorts of temptations, yea, to wrestle with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, yet in this which we have with ourselves, which is wholly within us and from us, there is more of warring, fighting, captivating, wounding, crying out for help and assistance, a deep sense of such a violence as is used in taking away the life of a mortal enemy, than in anything else we are called to. And thirdly, the end aimed at in this duty is destruction, as it is of all killing. Sin, as was said, has a life, and that such a life as whereby it not only lives, but rules and reigns in all that are not born of God. By the entrance of grace into the soul, it loses its dominion, but not its being, its rule, but not its life. The utter ruin, destruction, and gradual annihilation of all the remainders of this cursed life of sin is our design and aim in this work and duty, which is therefore called mortification. The design of this duty, wherever it is in sincerity, is to leave sin neither being nor life nor operation. And some directions, as our manner is, may be taken from what we have discoursed concerning the nature of this duty, directive of our own practices. First, it is evident from what has been discovered that it is a work which has a gradual progress in the proceed, whereof we must continually be exercised, and this respects in the first place the principle of sin itself. Every day, and in every duty, a specialized to be had to the abolition and destruction of this principle. It will no otherwise die but by being gradually and constantly weakened, spirit, and it heals its wounds, and recovers strength. So many who have attained to a great degree in the mortification of sin do by their negligence suffer it, in some instance or other, so to take heed again that they never recover their former state while they live. And this is the reason why we have so many withering professors among us, decayed in their graces, fruitless in their lives, in every way conformed to the world. There are some, indeed, who, being under the power of that blindness and darkness, which is a principal part of the deprivation of our nature, do neither see nor discern the inward secret actings and motions of sin. Its deceit and restlessness, its mixing itself one way or other in all our duties, with the defilement and guilt in which these things are accompanied, who judge that God scarce takes notice of anything but outward actions, and it may be not much of them neither, so as to be displeased with them, unless they are very foul indeed, which yet he is easily entreated to pass by and excuse, who judge this duty superfluous, despising both the confession and mortification of sin and this root and principle of it. But those who have received most grace and power from above against it are of all the others the most sensible of its power and guilt and of the necessity of applying themselves continually to its destruction. Secondly, with respect to its inclinations and operations in which it variously exerts its power in all particular instances, we are continually to watch against it and to subdue it. And this concerns us in all that we are and do, in our duties, in our calling, in our conversation with others, in our retirements, in the frames of our spirits, in our straits, in our mercies, in the use of our enjoyments, in our temptations. If we are negligent to any occasion, we shall suffer by it. This is our enemy, and this is the war we are engaged in. Every mistake, every neglect, is perilous. And thirdly, the end of this duty with respect to us, expressed by the Apostle, is that henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 6.6, 6, which refers to the perpetration of actual sins, the bringing forth of the actual fruits of the flesh, internal or external also. In whomsoever the old man is not crucified with Christ, let him think what he will of himself, he is a servant of sin. If he have not received virtue from the death of Christ, if he be not wrought to a conformity to him in it, whatever else he may do or attain, however he may in anything, in many things change his course and reform his life, he serves sin and not God. 
Our great design ought to be that we should no longer serve sin, which the apostle in the ensuing verses gives us many reasons for. It is indeed the worst service that a rational creature is capable of, and will have the most doleful end. What, therefore, is the only way and means in which we may attain this end? Namely, that all sin will abide in us, yet that we may not serve it, which will secure us from its danger. This is that mortification of it which we insist on, and no other. If we expect to be freed from the service of sin, by its own given over to press its dominion upon us, or by any composition with it, or any other way but by being always killing or destroying of it, we do but deceive our own souls. And indeed it is to be feared that the nature of this duty is not sufficiently understood or not sufficiently considered. Men look upon it as an easy task, and as that which will be carried on with a little diligence and ordinary attendance. But do we think it is for nothing that the Holy Ghost expresses the duty of opposing sin, and weakening his power by mortification, killing, or putting to death? Is there not somewhat peculiar in this, beyond any other act or duty of our lives? Certainly there is intimated a great contest of sin for the preservation of its life. Everything will do its utmost to preserve its life and being. So will sin do also, and if it be not constantly pursued with diligence and holy violence, it will escape our assaults. Let no man think to kill sin with few easy or gentle strokes. He who has once smitten a serpent, if he follow not on his blow until he be slain, may repent that ever he began the quarrel. And so will he who undertakes to deal with sin and pursues it not constantly to its death. Sin will, after a while, revive, and a man must die. It is a great and fatal mistake if we suppose this work will admit of any remissness or intermission. Again, the principle to be slain is in ourselves, and so possessed of our faculties is that it is called ourselves. It cannot be killed without a sense of pain and trouble. Hence it is compared to the cutting off of right hands and the plucking out of right eyes. Lest it pretend to be useful to the state and condition of men that are pleasant and satisfactory to the flesh will not be mortified without such a violence as a whole soul shall be deeply sensible of. And a number of other things might be insisted on and manifest how men deceive themselves if they suppose this duty is that which they may carry on in a negligent, careless course and manner. Is there no danger in this warfare? No watchfulness? No diligence required of us? Is it so easy a thing to kill an enemy who has so many advantages of force and fraud? Therefore, if we take care of our souls, we are to attend to this duty with that care, diligence, watchfulness, and earnest contention of spirit which the nature of it requires. And also, there is no less fatal mistake where we make the object of this duty to be only some particular lust or the fruits of them in actual sins, as was before observed. This is the way with many. They will make head against some sins, which on one account or other they find themselves concerned in, But if they will observe their course, they shall find with how little success they do it. For the most part, sin gets ground upon them, and they continually groan under the power of its victories. And the reason is because they mistake their business. Contests against particular sins are only to comply with light and convictions. Mortification with a design for holiness respects the body of sin, the root in all its branches. The first will miscarry, and the latter will be successful. And in this consists the difference between that mortification which men are put upon by convictions from the law, which always proves fruitless, and that in which we are acted by the spirit of the gospel. The first respects only particular sins, as the guilt of them reflects upon conscience. The latter, the whole interest of sin, as opposed to the renovation of the image of God in us. Number three. That which remains further to be demonstrated is that the Holy Spirit is the author of this work in us, so that although it is our duty, it is His grace and strength in which it is performed, is also the manner how it is wrought by Him, which is principally intended first. For the first we have the truth of it asserted in Romans 8.13, If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, it is we that are to mortify the deeds of the flesh, it is our duty, but of ourselves we cannot do it, it must be done in or by the Spirit. 
Whether we take the Spirit here for the person of the Holy Ghost, as the context seems to require, or take it for the gracious principle of spiritual life and the renovation of our nature, not the Spirit himself, but that which is born of the Spirit, it is all one as to our purpose. The work is taken from our own natural power or ability and resolved into the grace of the Spirit. And that we go no further for the proof of our assertion, it may suffice to observe that the confirmation of it is the principal design of the Apostle from the second verse of that chapter to the end of the thirteenth. That the power and reign of sin its interest and prevalency in the minds of believers are weakened, impaired, and finally destroyed, so as that all the pernicious consequences of it shall be avoided by the Holy Ghost, and that these things could no otherwise be effected, he both affirms and proves at large. In the foregoing chapter, from the seventh verse to the end, he declares the nature, properties, and efficacy of indwelling sin, as the remainders of it still abide in believers. And whereas the twofold conclusion might be made from the description he gives of the power and actings of this sin, or a double question arise, to the great disconsolation of believers, he does in this chapter remove them both, manifesting that there was no cause for such conclusions or exceptions from anything by him delivered. The first of these is, that of such, if this be the power and prevalency of indwelling sin, if it so obstruct us in our doing, that which is good and impetuously incline us to evil, what will become of us in the end? How shall we answer for all the sin and guilt which we have contracted by it? We must, we shall, therefore, perish under the guilt of it. And the second conclusion which is apt to arise from the same consideration is, that seeing the power and prevalency of sin is so great, and that we in ourselves are no way able to make resistance to it, much less to overcome it. It cannot be but that at length it will absolutely prevail against us and bring us under its dominion to our everlasting ruin. Both these conclusions the Apostle obviates in this chapter or removes them if laid as objections against what he had delivered. And this he does first by a tacit concession that they will both of them be found true towards all who live and die under the law without an interest in Jesus Christ. For affirming that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, he grants that those who are not so cannot avoid it. Such is the guilt of the sin, and such are the fruits of it, in all in whomsoever it abides, that it makes them obnoxious to condemnation. But secondly, there is a deliverance from this condemnation, and from all liableness to it, by free justification in the blood of Christ, Romans 8, 1. For those who have an interest in him, and are made partakers of it. Although sin may grieve them, trouble and perplex them, and by its deceit and violence cause them to contract much guilt in their surprisals, yet they need not despond or be utterly cast down. There is a stable ground of consolation provided for them, and that there is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Thirdly, that none may abuse this consolation of the gospel to countenance themselves to a continuance in the service of sin, he gives a limitation of the subjects to whom it belongs, namely all them, and only them who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, verse 1. As for those who give up themselves to the conduct of this principle of indwelling sin, who comply with its motions and inclinations, being acted wholly by its power, let them neither flatter nor deceive themselves, there is nothing in Christ nor the gospel to free them from condemnation. It is they only who give up themselves to the conduct of the spirit of sanctification and holiness that have an interest in this privilege. Fourthly, as to the other conclusion taken from the consideration of the power and prevalency of this principle of sin, he prevents or removes it by a full discovery how and by what means that power of it shall be so broken, its strength abated, its prevalency disappointed, and itself destroyed is that we need not fear the consequence of it before mentioned but rather may secure ourselves that we shall be the death thereof, and not that the death of our souls. Now this he says by the law or power of the spirit of life, which is in Christ Jesus, verse 2. And in this he proceeds to declare that it is by the effectual working of the spirit in us alone that we are enabled to overcome the spiritual adversary. This being sufficiently evident, it remains only that we declare, secondly, the way and manner how he produces this effect of his grace. First, 
The foundation of all mortification of sin is from the inhabitation of the Spirit in us. He dwells in the persons of believers as in his temple, and so he prepares it for himself. Those defilements or pollutions which render the souls of men unmeet habitations for the Spirit of God do all of them consist in sin inherent and its effects. These therefore he will remove and subdue that he may dwell in us suitably to his holiness. Verse 11. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. Our mortal bodies, or our bodies, is obnoxious to death by reason of sin, as verse 10, and the quickening of these mortal bodies is their being freed from the principle of sin, or death in his power, by a contrary principle of life and righteousness. It is a freeing of us from being in the flesh that we may be in the spirit, verse 9. And by what means is this effected? It is by the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, verse 11. That is, of the Father, which also is called the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of Christ, verse 9. For he is equally the Spirit of the Father and the Son. And he is described by this periphrasis, both because there is a similitude between that work, as to its greatness and power, which God wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and what he works in believers in their sanctification, Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20. And because this work is wrought in us by virtue of the resurrection of Christ. But under what special consideration does he effect this work of mortifying sin in us? It is as he dwells in us. God does it by a spirit that dwells in us. Romans 8 verse 11. As it is a work of grace, it is said to be wrought by the spirit. And it is our duty we are said to work it through the spirit. Verse 13. And let men pretend what they please, if they have not the Spirit of Christ dwelling in them, they have not mortified any sin. But do you yet walk after the flesh, and continuing so to do, shall die. Also, as this is the only spring of mortification in us, as it is a grace, so the consideration of it is a principal motive to it, as it is a duty. So our apostle pressing to it does it by this argument, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. To which we may add that weighty caution which he gives us to the same purpose in chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Whereas, therefore, in every duty... Two things are principally considered. First, the life and spring of it, as it is wrought in us by grace. Secondly, the principal reason for it and motive to it, as it is to be performed in ourselves by the way of duty. Both these, as to this manner of mortification, center in this inhabitation of the spirit. For first, it is he who mortifies and subdues our corruptions, who quickens us to life, holiness, and obedience as he dwells in us that he may make and prepare a habitation meet for himself. And secondly, the principal reason and motive which we have to attend to it with all care and diligence as the duty is, that we may thereby preserve his dwelling place so as becomes his grace and holiness. And indeed, whereas, as our Savior tells us, they are things which arise from and come out of the heart that defile us, there is no greater nor more forcible motive to contend against all the defiling actings of sin, which is our mortification, than this, that by the neglect hereof the temple of the Spirit will be defiled, which we are commanded to watch against under the severe combination of being destroyed for our neglect therein. If it be said that whereas we do acknowledge that there are still remainders of the sin in us, and they are accompanied with their defilements, how can it be supposed that the Holy Ghost will dwell in us, or in any one that is not perfectly holy? I answer first that the great manner which the Spirit of God considers in his opposition to sin, and that of sin to his work, is dominion and rule. This the Apostle makes evident in Romans 6, verses 12 to 14. Who or what shall have the principal conduct of the mind and soul, chapter 8, verses 7 to 9, is a matter in question. Where sin has a rule, there the Holy Ghost will never dwell. He enters into no soul as his habitation, but at the same instant he dethrones sin, spoils it of its dominion, and takes the rule of the soul into the hand of its own grace. Where he has effected this work and brought his adversary into subjection, there he will dwell, though sometimes his habitation be troubled by a subdued enemy. 
Secondly, the souls and minds of them who are really sanctified have continually such a sprinkling with the blood of Christ, and are so continually purified by virtue from a sacrifice and oblation, is that they are never unmeet habitations for the Holy Spirit of God. Secondly, the manner of the actual operation of the Spirit of God in effecting this work, or how he mortifies sin, or enables us to mortify it, is to be considered, and an acquaintance herewith depends on a knowledge of the sin that is to be mortified, which we have before described. It is a vicious, corrupt habit and inclination to sin, which is in us by nature, that is the principal object of this duty, or the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. When this is weakened in us as to its power and efficacy, when its strength is abated and its prevalency destroyed, then is this duty in its proper discharge and mortification carried on in the soul. This the Holy Ghost does first by implanting in our minds and all our faculties a contrary habit and principle with contrary inclinations, dispositions, and actings. Namely, a principle of spiritual life and holiness bringing forth the fruits of it. By means of this is this work effected, for sin will no otherwise die but by being killed and slain. And whereas this is gradually to be done, it must be by warring and conflict. There must be something in us that is contrary to it, which opposing it, conflicting with it, does insensibly and by degrees, for it dies not at once, work out its ruin and destruction. As in a chronical distemper the disease continually combats and conflicts with the powers of nature, until having insensibly improved them, it prevails to its dissolution, so is it in this manner. These adverse principles, with their contrariety, opposition, and conflict, the Apostle expressly asserts and describes, as also their contrary fruits and actings, with the issue of the whole, Galatians 5, verses 16 to 25, the contrary principles are the flesh and spirit, and their contrary actings are in lusting and warring one against the other. Verse 16. Walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Not to fulfill the lust of the flesh is to mortify it, for it neither will nor can be kept alive if its lust be not fulfilled. And he gives a fuller account of it in verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. If by the Spirit the Spirit of God himself be intended, yet he lusts not in us, but by virtue of that Spirit which is born of him, that is the new nature or holy principle of obedience which he works in us. In a way of their mutual opposition to one another, the Apostle describes it large in the following verses by instancing in the contrary effects of the one and the other. But the issue of the whole is, verse 24, They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts, they have crucified it, that is, fastened it to the cross, where at length it may expire. And this is a way of it, namely the actings of the Spirit against it, and the fruits produced by it. So he shuts up his discourse with that exhortation, If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. That is, if we are endowed with the spiritual principle of life, which is to live in the Spirit, then let us act, work, and improve that spiritual principle to the ruin and mortification of sin. This, therefore, is the first way in which the Spirit of God mortifies sin in us, and in a compliance with it, under his conduct, do we regularly carry on this work and duty, that is, we mortify sin by cherishing the principle of holiness and sanctification in our souls, laboring to increase and strengthen it by growing in grace, and by constancy and frequency in acting of it in all duties, on all occasions, abounding in the fruits of it. Growing, thriving, and improving in universal holiness is a great way of the mortification of sin. The more vigorous the principle of holiness is in us, the more weak, infirm, and dying will be that of sin. The more frequent and lively are the actings of grace, the feebler and seldomer will be the actings of sin. The more we abound in the fruits of the Spirit, the less shall we be concerned in the works of the flesh. And we do but deceive ourselves if we think sin will be mortified on any other terms. Men, when they are galled in their consciences and disquieted in their minds with any sin or temptation thereunto, in which their lusts or corruptions are either influenced by Satan, or entangled by objects, occasions, and opportunities, set themselves off times in good earnest to oppose and subdue it by all the ways and means they can think of. But all they do is in vain. And so they find it at last, to their cost and sorrow, 
The reason is because they neglect his course, without which never any one sin was truly mortified in the world, nor ever will so be. The course I intend is that of laboring universally to improve a principle of holiness, not in this or that way, but in all instances of holy obedience. This is that which will ruin sin, and without it nothing else will contribute anything to it. Bring a man to the law, urge him with the purity of his doctrines, the authority of his commands, the severity of its threatenings, the dreadful consequences of its transgression. Suppose him convinced by this of the evil and danger of sin, of the necessity of its mortification and destruction. Will he be able to hereon discharge this duty so as that sin may die and the soul may live? The apostle assures us of the contrary in Romans 7 verses 7 and 9. The whole effect of the application of the law and its power to indwelling sin is but to irritate, provoke, and increase its guilt. And what other probable way besides this to this end can anyone fix upon? Secondly, the Holy Ghost carries on this work in us as a grace and enables us to it as our duty by those actual supplies and assistances of grace which he continually communicates to us for the same divine operations. The same supplies of grace, which are necessary to the positive acts and duties of holiness, are necessary also to this end, that sin and the actual motions and lustings of it may be mortified. So the apostle issues his long account of the conflict between sin and the soul of a believer, and his complaint thereon with that good word, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 7 verse 25, namely, who supplies me with gracious assistance against the power of sin. Temptation is successful only by sin, James 1, verse 14. And it was with respect to an especial temptation that the Lord Christ gives that answer to the apostle, My grace is sufficient for thee, 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It is the actual supply of the Spirit of Christ that enables us to withstand our temptations and subdue our corruptions. In Philippians 1, 19, an additional supply, as an occasion requires, beyond our constant daily provision. Hebrews 4.16, grace given in to help seasonably upon our cry made for it. Of the nature of these supplies we have discoursed before. I shall now only observe that in the life of faith and dependence on Christ, the expectation and derivation of these supplies of grace and spiritual strength is one principal part of our duty. These things are not empty notions, as some imagine. If Christ be a head of influence to us, as well as of rule, as a head natural is to the body, if he be our life, if our life be in him, and we have nothing but what we do receive from him, if he give to us supplies of his spirit and increases of grace, and if it be our duty by faith to look for all these things from him, and that by the means of receiving them, which things are all expressly and frequently affirmed in the scripture, then is this expectation and derivation of spiritual strength continually from him, the way we are to take for the actual mortification of sin. And therefore, if we would be found in a successful discharge of this duty, it is required of us first, that we endeavor diligently in the whole course of our lives, after these continual supplies of grace, that is, that we wait for them in all those ways and means in which they are communicated. For although the Lord Christ gives them out freely and bountifully, Yet our diligence and duty will give the measure of receiving them. If we are negligent in prayer, meditation, reading, hearing of the word, and other ordinances of divine worship, we have no ground to expect any great supplies to the sin. And secondly, that we live in a bound in the actual exercise of all those graces, which are most directly opposite to those peculiar lusts or corruptions that we are most exercised with or obnoxious to. For sin and grace try their interest and prevalency in particular instances. If therefore any are more than ordinarily subject to the power of any corruption, as passion, inordinate affections, love of the world, distrust of God, unless they be constant in the exercise of those graces which are diametrically opposed to them, they will continually suffer under the power of sin. Thirdly, it is the Holy Spirit which directs us to and helps us in the performance of those duties which are appointed of God to the sin, that they may be means of the mortification of sin. To the right use of those duties, for such there are, two things are required. First, that we know them aright in their nature and use, 
is also that they are appointed of God to this end, and then secondly, that we perform them in a due manner. And both these we must have from the Spirit of God. He is given to believers to lead them into all truth. He teaches and instructs them by the word, not only what duties are incumbent on them, but also how to perform them with respect to what ends. It is required that we know them aright in their nature, use, and ends, firstly, for lack of it, or through the neglect of looking after it, all sorts of men have wandered after foolish imaginations about this work, either as to the nature of the work itself, or as to the means in which it may be effected. For it being a grace and duty of the gospel, thence only is it truly to be learned, and that by the teachings of the Spirit of God. And it may not be amiss to give some instances of the darkness of men's minds and their mistakes in it. First, a general apprehension that somewhat of this nature is necessary, arising from the observation of the disorder of our passions, and the exorbitancy of the lies of most in the world is suited even to the light of nature, and was from this variously improved by the philosophers of old. To this purpose did they give many instructions about denying and subduing the disorderly affections of the mind, conquering passions, moderating desires, and the like. But while their discoveries of sin rose no higher than the actual disorder they found in the affections and passions of the mind, while they knew nothing of the deprivation of the mind itself and had nothing to oppose to what they did discover, but moral considerations, and those most of them notoriously influenced by vainglory and applause, they never attained to anything of the same kind, with the due mortification of sin. Secondly, we may look into the papacy and take a view of the great appearance of this duty which is therein, and we shall find it all disappointed, because they are not led to nor taught the duties in which it may be brought about by the Spirit of God. They have by the light of the Scripture a far clearer discovery of the nature and power of sin than had the philosophers of old. The commandment also being variously brought and applied to their consciences, they may, and doubtless are, and have been, many of them, made deeply sensible of the actings and tendency of indwelling sin. In this sense, is a terror of death and eternal judgment. Things being so stated, persons who were not profligate, nor had their consciences seared, could not refrain from contriving ways and means how sin might be mortified and destroyed. But whereas they had lost a true apprehension of the only way in which this might be effected, they betook themselves to innumerable false ones of their own. This is a spring of all the austerities, disciplines, fasting, self-macerations, and the like, which are exercised or in use among them. For although they are now in practice turned mostly to the benefit of the priests, and an indulgence to sin and the penitence, yet they were invented and set on foot at first with the design to use them as engines for the mortification of sin. And they have a great appearance in the flesh to that end and purpose, but yet when all was done, they found by experience that they were insufficient to this. Sin was not destroyed, nor conscience pacified by them. But secondly, it is required that the duties to be used to this end be rightly performed, in faith, to the glory of God. Without this, a multiplication of duties is an increase of burden and bondage, and that is all. Now that we can perform no duty in this way or manner without the special assistance of the Holy Spirit has been sufficiently before evinced. And the duties which are appointed of God in an especial manner to this end are prayer, meditation, watchfulness, abstinence, wisdom or circumspection, with reference to temptations and their prevalency. Now to go over these duties in particular nor to show in which their special efficacy to this end and purpose consists, I shall only give some general rules concerning the exercising of our souls in them and some directions for their right performance. First, all these duties are to be designed and managed with a special respect to this end. It will not suffice that we are exercised in them in general and with regard only to this general end. We are to apply them to this particular case, designing in and by them the mortification and ruin of sin, especially when, by its special actings in us, it discovered itself in a peculiar manner to us. No man who wisely considers himself, his state and condition, his occasions and temptations, can be wholly ignorant of his special corruptions and inclinations, in which he is ready for halting, as the psalmist speaks. He that is, so lives in the dark to himself, and walks it peradventures with God, not knowing how he walks nor where he goes. 
David probably had respect to this when he said, I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Psalm 18, verses 21 to 23. He could have done nothing of all this, nor preserved his integrity in walking with God, had he not known and kept a continual watch upon his own iniquity, or that working of sin in him which most peculiarly inclined to dispose him to evil. Upon this discovery we are to apply these duties in a particular manner to the weakening and ruin of the power of sin. As they are all useful and necessary, so the circumstances of our condition will direct us which of them in particular we ought to be most conversant in. Sometimes prayer and meditation claim this place as when our danger arises solely from ourselves and our own perverse inclinations, disorderly affections, or unruly passions. Sometimes watchfulness and abstinence when sin takes occasion from temptations, concerns, and businesses in the world. Sometimes wisdom and circumspection when the avoidance of temptations and opportunities for sin is in a special manner required of us. These duties, I say, are to be managed with a peculiar design to oppose, defeat, and destroy the power of sin, and in which they have a powerful influence, is designed of God to that end. For secondly, all these duties rightly improved work two ways towards the end design. First, morally, and by way of impetration, namely of help and assistance. Secondly, really, by an immediate opposition to sin and its power, whence assimilation to holiness arises. First, these duties work morally by way of impetration. I shall instance only in one of them, and that is prayer. There are two parts of prayer with respect to sin and its power. First, complaints. Secondly, petitions. First, complaints. So is the title of Psalm 102, a prayer of the afflicted when he is overwhelmed and pours out his complaint before the Lord. So David expresses himself in Psalm 55, 2. Attend to me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. His prayer was a doleful lamentation. In Psalm 142, verse 2. I poured out my complaint before him, I showed before him my trouble. This is the first work of prayer with respect to sin, its power and prevalency. The soul, therein, pours out its complaints to God and shows before him the trouble it undergoes on the account of it. And this it does in an humble acknowledgement of its guilt, crying out of its deceit and violence. For all just and due complaint respects that which is grievous and which is beyond the power of the complainer to relieve himself against. Of this sort there is nothing to be compared with the power of sin as to believers. This therefore is and ought to be the principal manner and subject of their complaints and prayer, yea, the very nature of the whole case is such as that the apostle could not give an account of without great complaints. Romans 7.24 This part of prayer indeed is with profligate persons derided and scorn, but it is acceptable with God, and that wherein believers find ease and rest to their souls, for let the world scoff while it pleases, what is more acceptable to God than for his children, out of pure love to him and holiness, out of fervent desires to comply with his mind and will, and by this to attain conformity to Jesus Christ, to come with their complaints to him of the distance they are kept from these things by the captivating power of sin, be well in their frail condition, and humbly acknowledging all the evils they are liable to upon the account of it. Would any man have thought it possible had not experience convinced him that so much Luciferian pride and atheism should possess the minds of any who be esteemed Christians as to scoff at and deride these things? That anyone should ever read the Bible or once consider what he is and with whom he has to do and be ignorant of this duty? But we have nothing to do with such persons but to leave them to please themselves while they may with these fond and impious imaginations. They will come either in this world, which we hope and pray for, in their repentance to know their folly, or in another, I say these complaints of sin poured out before the Lord. These cryings out of deceit and violence are acceptable to God and prevalent with him to give out aid and assistance. He owns believers as his children and has the bowels and compassion of a father towards him. Sin he knows to be their greatest enemy, and which fights directly against their souls. Will he then despise their complaints and their bemoaning of themselves before him? Will he not avenge them of that enemy and that speedily? Jeremiah thirty one, eighteen to twenty. Men who think they have no other enemies, none to complain of, 
but such as oppose them or obstruct them or oppress them in their secular interests, advantages, and concerns, are strangers to these things. Believers look on sin as their greatest adversary and know that they suffer more from it than from all the world. Allow them, therefore, to make their complaints of it to him who pities them and who will relieve them and avenge them. Secondly, prayer is directly petitions to this purpose. It consists of petitions to God for supplies of grace to conflict and conquer sin with. I need not prove this. No man prays as he ought. No man joins in prayer with another who prays as he ought. But these petitions are a part of his prayer. Especially will they be so, and ought they so to be, when the mind is peculiarly engaged in the design of destroying sin. And these petitions or requests are, as far as they are gracious and effectual, wrought in us by the Holy Ghost, who therein makes intercession for us according to the will of God, and by this does he carry on this work of the mortification of sin, for his work it is. He makes us put up prevalent requests to God for such continual supplies of grace, in which it may be constantly kept under, and at length destroyed. And this is the first way in which this duty has an influence to mortification, namely morally and by way of impetration. This duty of the mortification of sin has a real efficiency to the same end. It does itself, and rightly performed and duly attended to, mightily prevail to the weakening and destruction of sin. For in and by fervent prayer, especially when it is designed to this end, the habit, frame, and inclination of the soul to universal holiness, with the detestation of all sin, are increased, cherished, and strengthened. The soul of a believer is never raised to a higher intention of spirit in the pursuit of, love to, and delight in holiness, nor is more conformed to it, or cast into the mold of it, than it is in prayer. And frequency in this duty is a principal means to fix and consolidate the mind in the form and likeness of it. And so do believers oft times continue in and come off from prayer above all impressions from sin as to its inclinations and compliances. With such a frame I always continue how happy we would be. But abiding in a duty is the best way of reaching out after it. I say therefore that this duty is really efficient of the mortification of sin because in it all the graces in which it is opposed and weakened are excited, exercised and improved to that end is also the detestation and abhorrency of sin is increased in us. And where this is not so, there are some secret flaws in the prayers of men, which it will be their wisdom to find out and heal. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit carries on this work by applying in a special manner the death of Christ to us for that end. And this is another thing which, because the world understands not, it despises. But yet in whomsoever the death of Christ is not the death of sin, he shall die in his sins. To evidence this truth we may observe first in general that the death of Christ has a special influence into the mortification of sin, without which it will not be mortified. This is plainly enough testified to in the scripture. By his cross, that is, his death on the cross, we are crucified to the world, Galatians 6.14. Our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, Romans 6.6. 6. That is, sin is mortified in us by virtue of the death of Christ. Secondly, in the death of Christ with respect to sin there may be considered, first, his oblation of himself, and secondly, the application thereof to us. By the first it is that our sins are expiated as to their guilt, but from the latter it is that they are actually subdued as to their power. For it is by an interest in and a participation of the benefits of his death, which we call the application of it to us. Hereon are we said to be buried with him and to rise with him, whereof our baptism is a pledge, chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, not in an outward representation, as some imagine, of being dipped into the water and taken up again, which were to make one sign the sign of another, but in a powerful participation of the virtue of the death and life of Christ, in a death to sin and newness of life and holy obedience, which baptism is a pledge of, as it is a token of our initiation and implanting into him. So are we said to be baptized into his death, or into the likeness of it, that is, in his power, verse 3. Thirdly, the old man is said to be crucified with Christ, or sin to be mortified by the death of Christ, 
as was in part before observed on two accounts first. Of conformity, crisis ahead, the beginning or idea, of the new creation, the firstborn of every creature. Whatever God designs to us therein, he first exemplified in Jesus Christ, and we are predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, Romans 8, verse 29. Here of the Apostle gives us an express instance in the resurrection. Christ, the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. 1 Corinthians 15.23 It is so in all things. All that is worked in us, it is in resemblance and conformity to Christ. Particularly we are by grace planted in the likeness of his death, Romans 6.5 being made conformable to his death, Philippians 3.10, and so dead with Christ, Colossians 2.20. Now this conformity is not in our natural death, nor in our being put to death as he was, for it is that which we are made partakers of in this life, and that in a way of grace and mercy. But Christ died for sin, for our sin, which was a meritorious procuring cause of it, and he lived again by the power of God a likeness and conformity hereunto, God will work in all believers. There is by nature a life of sin in them, as has been declared. This life must be destroyed, sin must die in us, and we by it become dead to sin. And as he rose again, so are we to be quickened in into the newness of life. And this death of sin consists that mortification which we treat of, and without which we cannot be conformed to Christ in his death, which we are designed to. And the same Spirit which worked these things in Christ will, in the pursuit of his design, work that which answers to them all in his members. Secondly, in respect of efficacy, virtue goes forth from the death of Christ for the subduing and destruction of sin. It was not designed to be a dead and active passive example but it is accompanied with a power conforming and changing us into his own likeness. It is the ordinance of God to that end, which he therefore gives efficacy to. It is by a fellowship or participation in the sufferings that we are made conformable to his death. Philippians 3.10 This is an interest and a benefit of his sufferings. We also are made partakers of it. This makes us conformable to his death and the deaths of sin in us. The death of Christ is designed to be the death of sin. If Christ had not died, sin had never died in any sinner to eternity. Therefore, that there is a virtue and efficacy in the death of Christ to this purpose cannot be denied without a renunciation of all the benefits of it. On the one hand, the scripture tells us that he is our life, our spiritual life, the spring, fountain, and cause of it. We have nothing, therefore, that belongs thereunto but what is derived from him. They cast themselves out of the verge of Christianity, who suppose that the Lord Christ is no otherwise our life, or the author of life to us, but as he is revealed and taught the way of life to us. He is our life as he is our head, and it would be a sorry head that should only teach the feet to go and not communicate strength to the whole body so to do. And that we have real influences or life from Christ, I have sufficiently proved before. To our spiritual life, does ensue the death of sin. For this, on the other hand, is peculiarly assigned to his death and the testimonies before produced. This, therefore, is by virtue derived from Christ, that is, in a special manner from his death, as the scripture testifies. All the inquiry is how the death of Christ is applied to us, or which is the same, how we apply ourselves to the death of Christ for this purpose. And I answer, we do it two ways. First, by faith. The way to derive virtue from Christ is by touching of him. So the diseased woman in the gospel touched by the hem of his garment, and virtue went forth from him to stay her bloody issue, Matthew 9, 20 and 22. It was not her touching him outwardly, but her faith, which she acted then and thereby, that derived virtue from him. For so our Savior tells her in his answer, Daughter, be of comfort. Your faith has made you whole. But to what end was this touching of his garment? It was only a pledge and token of the particular application of the healing power of Christ to her soul, or her faith in him in particular for that end. 
for at the same time many thronged upon him in a press. So as his disciples marveled, he should ask who touched his clothes, Mark 5, verses 30 and 31. Yet was not any of them advantage but the poor sick woman. A great emblem it is of common profession on the one hand, and special faith on the other. Multitudes press and throng about Christ in a profession of faith and obedience, and in the real performance of many duties, but no virtue goes forth from Christ to heal them. But when anyone, though poor, though seemingly at a distance, gets but the least touch of him by special faith, this soul is healed. This is our way with respect to the mortification of sin. The scripture assures us that there is virtue and efficacy in the death of Christ to that end. The means in which we derive this virtue from him is by touching of him, that is, by acting faith on him in his death, for the death of sin. But how will this effect it? How will sin be mortified by it? I say how, by what power and virtue, were they healed in the wilderness who looked to the brazen serpent? Was it not because that was an ordinance of God which by his almighty power he made effectual to that purpose? The death of Christ being so as to the crucifying of sin, when it is looked on or applied to by faith, shall not divine virtue and power go forth to that end? The scripture and experience of all believers give testimony to the truth and reality of it. Besides, faith itself has acted on the death of Christ, has a peculiar efficacy to the subduing of sin. For beholding him thereby as in a glass we are changed into the same image, Second Corinthians 3, verse 18. And that which we peculiarly behold, we are peculiarly transformed into the likeness of. And moreover, it is the only means in which we actually derive from Christ the benefits of our union with him. From this we have all grace, or there is no such thing in the world. And a communication of it to us is in and by the actual exercise of faith principally. So it being acted with respect to his death, we have grace for the killing of sin. And by this become dead with him, crucified with him buried with him, as in the testimonies before produced. This is that which we call the application of the death of Christ to us, or our application of ourselves to the death of Christ for the mortification of sin. And they by whom this means are of us despised or neglected, who are ignorant of it or do blaspheme it, must live under the power of sin, to what invention soever they turn themselves for deliverance. According as we abide and abound in this will be our success. Those who are careless and remiss in the exercise of faith by prayer and meditation, in a way described, will find that sin will keep its ground and maintain so much power in them as shall issue in their perpetual trouble. And men who are much conversant with the death of Christ, not in notions and lifeless speculations, not in natural or carnal affections, like those which are raised in weak persons by images and crucifixes, but by holy actings of faith with respect to what is declared in the scripture as to its power and efficacy, will be implanted into the likeness of it and experience the death of sin in them continually. Secondly, we do it by love. Christ is crucified is the great object of our love, or should so be, for he is therein to sinners altogether lovely. Hence one of the ancients cried out, My love is crucified, and why do I stay behind? In the death of Christ, do his love, his grace, his condescension most gloriously shine forth. We may therefore consider three things with respect to this love. First, the object of it. Secondly, the means of the representation of that object to our minds and affections. Thirdly, the effects of it as to the case in hand. First, the object of it is Christ himself in his unsearchable grace, his unspeakable love, his infinite condescension his patient suffering and victorious power in his death or dying for us. It is not his death absolutely, but himself, as all these graces conspicuously shine forth in his death, which is intended. Secondly, and there are various ways in which this may be represented to our minds. First, men may do it to themselves by their own imaginations. They may frame and fancy the Lord things to themselves about it which is way of persons under deep and devout superstitions. But no love and sincerity will ever be ingenerated towards Jesus Christ by it. Secondly, it may be done by others in pathetical and tragical declarations of the outward part of Christ's sufferings, 
and as some have a great faculty to work upon the natural affections of their auditors, and great passions accompanied with tears and vows may be so excited, but for the most part there is no more in this work than what the same persons find in themselves it may be in the reading or hearing of a feigned story. For there is a sympathy in natural affections with the things that are their proper objects, though represented by false imaginations. Thirdly, it is done in the papacy, and among some others, by images and crucifixes and dolorous pictures, whereunto they pay great devotion with an appearance of ardent affections. But none of these is such a due representation of this object as to ingenerate sincere love towards Christ, crucified in any soul. Therefore, fourthly, this is done effectually only by the gospel, and in the dispensation of it according to the mind of God. For in this is Jesus Christ evidently crucified before our eyes, Galatians 3, verse 1. And this it does by proposing to our faith the grace, the love, the patience, the condescension, the obedience, the end and design of Christ in it. So as Christ died by faith as the proper object of sincere love. And being so stated, thirdly, the effects of it, as of all true love, are first adherence. Secondly, assimilation. First adherence. Love in the scripture is frequently expressed by this effect. The soul of one did cleave or was knit to another as that of Jonathan to David, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. So it produces a firm adherence to Christ crucified that makes a soul to be in some sense always present with Christ on the cross. And hence ensues, secondly, assimilation or conformity. None treat of the nature or effects of love, but they assign this as one of them, that it begets a likeness between the mind loving and the object beloved. And so I am sure it is in this matter. A mind filled with the love of Christ is crucified, and represented in the manner and way before described, will be changed into his image and likeness by the effectual mortification of sin, through a derivation of power and grace from this for that purpose. Fifthly, the Holy Ghost carries on this work by constant discoveries to and pressing on believers, on the one hand, the true nature and certain end of sin, and on the other, the beauty, excellency, usefulness, and necessity of holiness with the concerns of God, Christ, the gospel, and their own souls therein. A rational consideration of these things is all the ground and reason of mortification in the judgment of some men. But we have proved that there are other causes of it also, and now I add that if we have no consideration of these things, but what our own reason is of itself able to suggest to us, it will never be prevalent to any sincere or permanent attempt in a mortification of any sin whatever. Let men make the best of their reason they can in the searching and consideration of the perverse nature and dreadful consequence of sin, of the perfect peace and future blessedness which attend the practice of holiness, they will find an obstinacy and stubbornness in their hearts not conquerable by any such reasonings or considerations. That conviction of sin and righteousness, which is useful and prevalent to that end and purpose, is wrought in us by the Holy Ghost, John 16.8. Although he makes use of our minds, understandings, reasons, consciences, and the best of our consideration in this manner, yet if he give not a peculiar efficacy and power to all, the work will not be effectual. When he is pleased to make use of reasons and motives, taken from the nature and end of sin and holiness, to the mortification of sin, they shall hold good and bind the soul to this duty, against all objections and temptations that would divert it whatever. And thus I have briefly, and I confess weakly and obscurely, delineated the work of the Holy Ghost in the sanctification of them that believe. Many things might have been more enlarged and particularly inquired into, what have been discoursed I judge sufficient to my present purpose, and I doubt not but that what has been argued from plain scripture and experience is sufficient, is to direct us in the practice of true evangelical holiness. So with all sober persons to cast out of all considerations that fulsome product of pride and ignorance, that all gospel holiness consists in the practice of moral virtues. End of the chapter on the Holy Spirit and the Mortification of Sin by John Owen. The following is from Cases of Conscience by Samuel Pike and Samuel Hayward, originally published in 1755, and it is case number two, What Method Must a Christian in Declining Circumstances Take? 
to recover a healthful and vigorous frame of soul, so as to be able to maintain real and close communion with God amidst the hurries and businesses of this world. This question is formed from the following letter, quote, I have, through a great multiplicity of worldly affairs and a deep engagement in them, lost that savor and relish for divine things I once experienced, and am become a sad stranger to that real communion with God which was heretofore my chief joy. And I am so greatly declined in the Christian life that I can sometimes omit the duties of secret prayer and meditation, and at other times I perform this with formality and coldness. Yet I'm no way suitably affected with my sad defections. Indeed, sometimes I have been helped to bemoan my sad case before God, and to plead with the blessed Jesus, the great and good physician, to heal and help me. But alas, things remain with me as before. And if there be any alteration in my case, I really think it is for the worse. This is a question which I doubt not is suitable to the cases of many of God's people in the present dark and degenerate day, when there are so many temptations and difficulties to cool their zeal, damp their joy, and fill them with formality and indifference of spirit in the service of the Redeemer. It is not with us as it was with our forefathers. We have not their zeal, their faith, their love. We are not humble as they were, nor so watchful as they against the temptations and sins to which we are exposed. We discover not that acquaintance with the power of religion which they had. We walk not so close with God as they. In short, we have the name, the form, but we have not so much of the life, the spirit, the power of godliness as our forefathers had, who are now in glory. We are more worldly, more selfish, more proud and haughty, more careless and negligent of our frames and our conversation, and have in all respects more of the appearance of almost Christians than they. Yet, blessed be God, this is not the case with every individual. There are a few who desire to honor God by a lively faith, a becoming zeal, and a close and humble walk. A few whose concern it is to make the greatest advances in grace and to maintain daily communion with God amidst the various hurries of life. They cannot live long without God. They are never easy but when they are feeling his animating and quickening presence with them, and their souls in consequent of it warmed, enlivened, and breathing out desires after him. This seems to be the case with the person who sent in the above question. You know something of the excellency of communion with God, my dear friend. You have found what it is to have a sweet relish for divine things, and now you are full of uneasiness at the sad loss you have sustained through the hurries and enjoyments of this life, and desirous of having your former experience revived, and to find your soul again in a lively, healthful, and vigorous condition. In this you are not alone. Many, I am persuaded, speak the same language you do, feel the same things, have the same desires, and are equally at a loss what to do. It is a case of some importance. May the Spirit of God enable me to answer it in such a manner as may, through a divine blessing, be effectual to bring your soul and the souls of others nearer to God and quicken you to the pursuit of that which has a tendency to promote your growth and grace and make you flourishing and lively Christians. But before I directly answer your question, I would make two or three observations upon it that may give encouragement to persons in such circumstances as well as be a caution to them in the pursuits of this world. Number one, it is a peculiar mercy when we find our souls in a declining condition to be immediately alarmed at it and sensible of it. When God is about to bestow the blessings of salvation, he first makes the sinner sensible of the need of them. So when he is about to revive his work in a soul that has been running astray from him, he gives him first a sense of his decline shows him from whence he has fallen, what a stranger he is to the life of religion, what ingratitude he has been guilty of, how much he has lost of the pleasures of the divine life, and how much he has dishonored that God who called him out of darkness into his marvelous light. To lie asleep, as David did, after his adultery and murder is awful. Oh, sin is of a hardening nature. The Christian is often stupefied and benumbed with it. It shuts his eyes and it hardens his heart. He has lost in some measure his zeal and liveliness. His graces are withering. 
His duties are cold and formal, nay, he can oft times omit them. He is not that communion with God he once enjoyed, and yet he appears to be contented. Melancholy case. Bless God that it is not your case. You appear to be sensible of the unhealthy condition your soul is in. You see it is not with you as in months past. Bless God, Christians, if you are sensible of any decays. If your eyes are open and your souls are impressed with the deep sense of the loss of communion with God, the neglect of duty or formality in it. Secondly, we should esteem it a mercy if when under a decline we are earnestly desirous of a revival. This appears to be the case with you, my friend. Methinks I see you viewing former seasons of communion, falling down before God and under a deep sense of your declining circumstances. Here you humbly addressing him in the following manner. Lord, show me what you would have me to do. I would acknowledge my many omissions of duty, my great carelessness and negligence, and would deeply be sensible of the loss I have sustained. O revive thy work in my soul, and let me not lie at this languishing rate. Lord, quicken, quicken this slothful heart, and kindle the sacred spark afresh, and let me be all alive for you. How happy is it when we are enabled to speak such language, and find our souls in such a frame as this. But on the other hand, to be careless and unconcerned, to be easy and contented in such circumstances is an awful sign that religion is languishing in our souls, and that there is no present appearances of an alteration. David, when awake, was not only sensible of the dangerous condition he had been in, but was desirous of a revival of the work of God in his soul, that he might again enjoy communion with him and flourish and prosper in the divine life. Therefore he earnestly prayed that God would graciously look upon him and return to him. Psalm 51, verse 7. Number 3. It is a difficult thing to have much to do with the world and the growing grace. Through the degeneracy of our hearts, the world has become an enemy to our souls and hindrance in our way to heaven. Many, like the young man, keep their enjoyments to the loss of their souls. The Christian himself, who has found the emptiness of the world and its insufficiency to satisfy an immortal desire, is notwithstanding ready to be too fond of it, and finds it a sad clog and hindrance to him at times. He would often leave it behind him when he goes to worship God, but it will follow him from duty to duty, interrupt his communion with God, lead his heart aside, and damp the exercise of every grace. How ready is a Christian to swell with pride on account of his flourishing enjoyments? We have need of great grace to keep us humble in prosperous circumstances, either of soul or body. Is a Christian immersed in cares? Here he is in danger of being filled with too much anxiety and of employing too much of his time in the world to the neglect of some important duties of religion, in a suitable discharge of which the divine life is kept up in the soul. Thus it is difficult for those who have much to do with the world to grow in grace. I mention this to quicken the Christian diligently to attend to those means that are necessary for his keeping up a lively sense of the things of God in his soul, and to keep him from being discouraged if at any time he sees he has lost his frame, through his many anxious cares or through the temptations arising from this world. I doubt not, but this is the case with many. Many of you, my dear friends, have known what it is to lose communion with God, through the hurries of life, what to have your souls out of tune, what it is to be tempted to the omission of duties, I would bring in myself with you and lay my hand upon my mouth, crying out, guilty, guilty. What then shall we do in such unpleasing circumstances? This leads me directly to answer the case, namely, what methods we must take to recover a healthful and vigorous frame of soul, so as to be able to maintain real and close communion with God amidst the hurries of life. It requires a person of great experience to give a suitable answer to so important a question. Sensible of my own weakness here, I hope I have earnestly entreated the assistance of the Spirit of God, in consequence of which my mind, I trust, has been directed to the following things, which I would now humbly suggest to you as necessary in this case. First, Examine carefully into the occasion of your decline. That God brings some afflictions upon his people in a way of sovereignty is plain, if we look into his word, but when he withholds the special influences of his spirit from us, 
the consequences of which are loss of communion with him, the withering of our graces and the decline with regard to the life of religion in our souls, we may immediately conclude that we have dishonored God in some instance or other and provoked him thus partly to leave us. It is necessary then to inquire into the occasions of God's withdrawment, not only for our present but for our future guidance. Was Job anxious to know why God contended with him in a way of affliction? And shall we not be solicitous to examine into the reasons of our present decline? To lose spiritual enjoyments is much more melancholy than to be under temporal afflictions. Come then, my soul, and come, my Christian friends, and particularly come you, my dear friend, who sent in the above case and are desirous of a revival. Come and let us examine in wherein we have provoked God to withdraw. What has been the reason of our late coldness and formality? How came we to lose any of our zeal for Christ? How is it we have been led to omit spiritual duties of prayer, meditation, and so on? Why is it we have not experienced the presence of the Spirit in ordinances, drawing our souls after Jesus and shedding abroad His love in our hearts? Oh, why is it that it is not with us as in months past, when we sat under the shadow of the Lord and His presence filled our souls with unspeakable joy? We have reason to be jealous of our wicked hearts, and a fear that they have led us aside, and so we have grieved the Holy Spirit, and He has discovered His displeasure. Let us make the inquiry. Perhaps we have been too much elated with pride. Pride is a great enemy to the divine life. It has often provoked the Spirit to withdraw His presence. That being in some measure left to ourselves, we might be humbled, and not think of ourselves beyond what we ought. It was pride that provoked God to leave Peter and see how shamefully he fell. Luke 22, 33, 57, and 58, 59, and 60. The Apostle Paul was like to be carried away with pride, even under those high enjoyments he was favored with. Therefore he had a messenger of Satan sent to buffet him. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 7. Some are proud of the world. They grow in riches and their hearts are lifted up, as if they were more amiable or had more interest in God than others. Is this your case, my friends? Examine. Have not temporal or spiritual enjoyments lifted you up too much? Have not these vain hearts been flattering you as persons of some peculiar worth? And have you not been ready to swell with the thought, and from such an apprehension to look with an unchristian air upon others? Again, perhaps you have been led by your enjoyments to indulge a security and carelessness of spirit. Through the sad wickedness of our hearts we have often been guilty here and so have suffered an unspeakable loss. It has often been suggested to us after spiritual enjoyments that our state is safe and secure. There is no depriving us of the promised inheritance. God has given us an evident token of his everlasting love to our souls. Therefore we need not be so much in duty, but may indulge a little liberty and enjoy a few of the pleasures and comforts of the present life, and all this consistent with our hopes of a better. These thoughts perhaps we have too eagerly sucked in from their having a plausible appearance, and they have proved poison to our souls. For a while we have been taking this innocent liberty, we have insensibly grown careless and secure and have lost our spiritual joy. This may be the case also as to temporal enjoyments. Inquire, therefore, have not these led you to a carelessness and security of spirit? God has perhaps increased your substance and given you everything richly to enjoy. You are like many of the world. You abound with comforts. And you must be like them too in frame and spirit. Oh, there is great danger here. They apprehend themselves to be too rich to be religious, that God will pay a deference to them on account of their station. And has not this been a temptation to you at times? And so you have sunk in your zeal and in close communion and converse with God. Again, perhaps you have loved this world too much. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2.15 Though you may not love the world in the sense of the Apostle, yet your affections may be so much set upon it as to make a jealous God withdraw the special tokens of his love from you. It is every way unsuitable to our profession of love to God, to be so fond of present things. It is offering the greatest affronts to our adorable Emmanuel, as if there were more excellency in the world than in him or as if he was not a sufficient portion for us. O Christian, inquire, inquire, my friend, how your heart stands as to the world. 
Have you been slighting your Lord, your husband, your best of friends by valuing the world too much? Again, perhaps through a multiplicity of engagements, you have been tempted to neglect those duties in which Christians meet with God and by which they bring their souls to be enlivened. Every duty is beautiful in a season. There is a time to mind the world and a time to attend to the affairs of the soul. To be diligent on our calling is doubtless a duty. A Christian who is careless and slothful in his worldly affairs is no honor to religion. I would not throw one reflection upon industry in the pursuit of our lawful business, but rather applaud it. But then we should remember that the world has not a right to all our time. Martha was encumbered about making provision for our Lord, when she ought to have been at his feet hearing his doctrine, Luke 10, 38 and 42. So the Christian is often in the world, when he should be in his family or in his closet. Perhaps your engagements are great. You are obliged to be much in company. This is a temptation to you to neglect some important duties, duties that have been made sweet and pleasant to your souls. You will permit me, my dear friends, to be quite free. The case under consideration gives me an opportunity for it, and the prosperity of our souls is a matter of such importance that it requires it. I cannot but be inclined to think that evening clubs, so frequent even amongst professors, are injurious to the Christian life. Let me here explain myself for fear of a mistake. I don't mean that we are to avoid all company and conversation in an evening. Christian conversation is necessary and greatly useful. Nay, while we are engaged in the affairs of this life, it will be often necessary for a Christian to mix with those that perhaps are not so. But when so much time is spent in evening visits, clubs, and so on, as interferes with and often sets aside the duties of the family in the closet, or leaves but little time for these things, no wonder we then lose ground in the divine life, especially if this is too much our practice. We should remember that real religion lies not in much talking, but in secret converse with God, and in an experience of his quickening presence and grace. Christian conversation indeed has an excellent tendency to promote this, and oh, that it was more found amongst us. But there is a great beauty and a good deal of Christian skill lies in timing of things. Our duty should not jostle out or prevent the discharge of another. Let me appeal to your conscience, so professor, and ask you a few questions. Is it your usual practice to spend your evenings abroad? What is the consequence? Do you find your family in a suitable disposition to attend a social worship at your coming home? Rather, are they not worried with the hurries of the day and wishing for rest? The duty is oftentimes in such a circumstance sadly curtailed, if not totally neglected. And how is it with the closet? That is seldom an evening visit. You have no time to look into your soul to mourn over the sins of the day or to call over its mercies. No time for reading or meditation. One neglect of this kind makes way for another and a professor can content himself with it. O oh, Christians, has this been the case with any of you? Has this been the case with you, my friend? Has a multiplicity of your affairs or have your engagements prevented your often being in your closet? What have you lost? But alas, you are contented and think that none can blame you so long as you have been in company with some of the friends of Jesus. Go on so and see what will be the consequences. You will gradually lose a relish for the power and pleasures of religion, and your zeal will too much degenerate into controversy. You may talk much of God, but you will walk but little with him. Pardon my freedom, my dear friends. I bring no charge against you. But what I would bring against myself, and would therefore put myself upon the inquiry as well as you. Thus examine into the occasions of your decline. I have given you some instances to direct and help your inquiries. But stop not here, but carefully examine everything by which you may have provoked God to withdraw his special presence from you. Secondly, when you have found the occasions of your decline, humble yourselves before the Lord. Guard carefully against them for the future. Get your heart sensibly affected with your loss, and earnestly pray that the Spirit may not depart from you, but graciously return to you. This is the case with David, of whom we have already spoken. When he was brought to a sense of his sins, how humble! He fell down prostrate before God, acknowledged and bewailed his backslidings. 
He was jealous lest he should have provoked God entirely to withdraw his presence and spirit from him. Therefore he expostulated with him for the return of his favor, and that he would restore those divine consolations which he had before experienced but had lately lost. Psalm 51, 11, and 12. Though we may not have been provoking God to withhold from us his special presence by the commission of such open and public sins as David, yet we have been too closely attached to the world. Have we neglected some of the great and important duties of the Christian life? Have we been too proud, too careless and secure in our frame, our walk and behavior? Have we been trifling with God? It certainly becomes us to humble ourselves before him, if we expect his return to us. We should draw near to him with weeping and lamentation, should be often endeavoring to impress our hearts with a sense of our ingratitude, should be often mourning before the Lord, and should set a mark upon those things that have been the occasions of our decline, that we may watch against him for the future, be often reflecting upon the loss you have had, consider the sickly condition your souls have been in while the spirit was withdrawn from you, Consider how justly God might have left you, had he been strict to mark your backslidings, and oh, admire his infinite patience, and earnestly pray for his spirit to return and breathe upon your dry bones. Let it be your daily concern to beg of God that he would keep your hearts, your affections, quicken your souls, and not leave you to coldness and formality. When Israel was exhorted to return to the Lord after they had sinned, they are directed to return by prayer and instructed how to pray or what to say. Hosea 14.2 Take with you words and turn to the Lord. Say to him, Take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So we will render thee the calves of our lips, and so on. Prayer suits all cases and is never to be neglected. Is any afflicted? Let him pray. James 5.13 So has any fallen, grieved the spirit, and lost in some measure that liveliness and vigor of soul he once experienced? Let him return to God by prayer. Take with you words, even those words which God has furnished you with, and come to him. Take a promise in your hand and come and plead it with God for the return of his presence and spirit. Number three, often make use of your covenant relation to God in pleading with him and with your own souls. The person that sent in the case under consideration does not appear to doubt of his being a Christian. The very form in which the question stands supposes it. And upon this supposition, I proceed to give you this necessary direction. Some indeed may say they cannot plead a covenant relation, for they are greatly in the dark about it, and are therefore afraid to do it. In answer to this and general observe, so long as you find your viewing and your pleading, your covenant relation quickens you, humbles you, sets you against all sin, and tends to fill you with love to Jesus and his service, look upon this as an evidence of your interest in the covenant. Plead, therefore, my friends, this covenant relation to God, if you would have it better with your souls, and would be in such a frame as to maintain communion with God. Plead it with God. A sense of it tends greatly to give you faith and fervency in prayer, and to fill you with hopes of the divine presence and favor. Here is a glorious argument to make use of with God. Rejoice in it, my dear friend, and make frequent use of it. Often throw yourself at the footstool of God's throne and address him in such language as this, Lord, am I not thine? Did you not, O Father, choose me from eternity and determine to bestow salvation upon me? Did you not, O mighty God, undertake for me, agree to put my name in the book of life, and in consequence of this come and suffer and die in my stead? And have you not renewed me, O eternal spirit, and set the broad seal of heaven upon my soul? If I am not thine, Lord, what means such instances of communion with you? What means this love to Jesus, these desires after a conformity to his image? Are not these as so many evidences of your everlasting love? And oh, will you leave me to wither and languish, to grow cold and formal? Will you not come and kindle this sacred spark afresh and carry on your work with an almighty efficacy? I acknowledge, Lord, I am unworthy of your favor. I have sinned and deserve your everlasting displeasure. But did it not please you of your own infinite grace to enroll my name amongst your chosen ones in the volume of eternity? And will you leave me? Lord, it was your own act, your free act, and I would humbly plead it. Therefore come and visit my soul. Shed abroad your love in my heart. 
pardon my backslidings, and may I be enabled to rejoice in the covenant love and walk and act as one who has a real interest in it. Thus plead with God and follow the example of the psalmist, who in all difficulties, temporal and spiritual, address God as his God. Oh, the sweetness, the happiness that is couched in these two words, my God. Number two, often make use of the same argument and plead this covenant relation with your souls. When you find your souls in danger through sin, when you have lost your frame and fill a coldness and formality and the hurries of the world, tempting you to a carelessness in and a negligence of duty, plead with your souls in some such manner as this, O oh, my soul, am I acting like an heir of glory to be thus encumbered, thus anxious, and thus careless? What did the Father love me from eternity and give me to his Son? Did Jesus suffer and die for me? And has the Spirit actually renewed me? In consequence of all this, is heaven my portion? Am I born to glory? Oh, and what so cold, so formal! I will not leave you, O my soul, in this withering condition. I will plead with you the Father's everlasting kindness. I will beseech you by the tender compassions of the Son of God who gave himself for you. I will press upon you the infinite love of the Spirit who said to you, Live. I will not leave till I find things better with you. May not the Father justly complain of you? Hear, O my soul, what he says. What did I look upon you from everlasting with infinite kindness, and are these the returns you are making? Is this like one of my chosen vessels? Did I pass by thousands and look upon thee? And is this all the sense you have of your obligations to me? Hear Jesus gently chiding you, O oh, my slothful soul, saying, What did I love you, so as to die for you? Was the day of your redemption upon my heart from everlasting? And shall my cause, my glory, lie so little upon thine? Behold, my wounded soul, see my bitter agonies, and all to rescue you from everlasting death. And will you not love me more? Hear the Spirit bringing in his charge against you and expostulating with you. Have I not a consequence of the Father's everlasting love? And a mediator's purchase come and brought you out of darkness into light? What evidences have I given you of covenant love? How have I calmed your troubled conscience, shed abroad a Savior's love into your heart? Been a spirit of grace and supplication in you, and a spirit of adoption too. And what are you so ungrateful, so cold and secure? Thus may the God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost upbraid and chide you, O my soul, and shall not this move you? Lord, my heart begins to melt. It softens, it yields to so much love. O oh, come and do with me what you please. May I hate sin. May I love you with greater fervency and view every earthly enjoyment with indifference and use all to your glory. So plead your covenant relation to God and all the consequences of it with your souls. Do it frequently and you will find it through the divine blessing, a happy means of enabling you to live above this world while you are in it, of humbling you for sin, quickening you under all decays and of bringing you into a spiritual and heavenly frame so as to maintain some communion with God amidst the hurries of life. Number four, if you would keep up communion with God while you are engaged in the affairs of the world, take care and watch over your frame, your ends and views. You may lawfully follow the world with diligence, but take care that you pursue those measures that are necessary to keep your hearts at a proper distance from the world, lest they should be too much carried away with it and entangled in it. Improve what time you can for God. Particularly take care of your frame before you actually enter upon your secular affairs. Be concerned that the world does not creep into your hearts when you rise in the morning. Your morning frames are of great importance. Labor to throw aside the world and do not enter upon business so you have earnestly sought the presence and blessing of God with and upon you. Consider well over in your closets the affairs of the day the temptations you are like to be exposed to, and be earnest with God for a special presence to keep you. And do endeavor to get your hearts impressed with the love of Jesus, and you will be in less danger of being carried away by the temptations of the day. You will read in the life of Colonel Gardner that that great man had always his two hours with God in the morning. If his regiment was to march at four, he would be up at two. I doubt not but that frame he had in his closet often went with him through the day, I would not intimate by this that it is the duty of every one of you, my friends, to spend two hours in your closets every morning. 
But I am satisfied that if no care is taken to set apart some time to God, that person can never be in a flourishing condition as to his soul. Let me tell you, early rising is not only good for the health of the body, but for the health of the soul too, provided some time is spent with God and communing with our own hearts. Oh, my friends, strive, wrestle with God in your morning hours for his presence in the day, and labor to get love to Jesus enkindled in your breast before you go out of your closets and watch over your frame in the day. Examine the ends and views of principles and springs from whence you act. Watch over your deceitful hearts. Walk as in the presence of God. In short, let the glory of God lie near upon your hearts. And be afraid of anything that may dishonor God and provoke his spirit to withdraw from you. Thus in endeavoring to cultivate a spiritual frame and temper, and a walk with humility and circumspection, you will give evidence of your being Christians indeed. You may expect the presence of God with you. And I doubt not but through his divine blessing you will find your souls in a thriving condition. I would now close these few hints with two remarks first. Hence we find that it is not an easy thing to be a flourishing Christian. We must live much in the exercise of faith. We must be much upon our guard against sin. We must be much in our closet seeking God by prayer, examining ourselves and keeping a strict watch over our hearts, lest they should deceive us. A careless Christian cannot be a flourishing one. If you would grow up like tall cedars and flourish as trees of righteousness, you must not be cold and lifeless, careless as to your frames and conversation. Like sentinels, you must be ever upon your watch. Like persons running a race, you must be pressing towards the mark with all your might. And like soldiers, you must be prepared for the battle and enter the field with your armor on, that you may get daily advantages over your spiritual enemies and may go from strength to strength, from one degree of grace to another. To be lively Christians, such as glorify God in every circumstance of life, requires grace to be much in exercise, much of the presence of God and constant supplies out of our Redeemer's inexhaustible fullness. Number two, we should be each concerned to inquire how it is with our souls, and if we are upon the decline, to attend upon the directions that have been given. Put off a manner of such vast importance no longer, but examine whether you are Christians indeed or not, and in what circumstances, whether thriving or declining. And if you are upon the decline, let me entreat you to consider what has been said upon this subject, and think it high time to awake out of sleep. Oh, if you have any concern for the honor of Christ, any concern for the peace and welfare of your precious souls, labor to have things better with you. Let your loins be girt and your lights burning, and may none of us be under the least alarm when death approaches, but then through grace be enabled to say, We have fought the good fight, we have finished our course, we have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for us a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give it that day, and not to us only, but also to all those that love his appearing. A reading from the book Cases of Conscience by Samuel Pike and Samuel Hayward.